Okay, so lecture one six, capacitors. Capacitors have two terminals and are composed of two conductive surfaces separated by some distance. There's a little typo there. Terminals. Um, this can be literally two plates, like two copper plates that are separated. Uh, but more frequently, uh, it's actually like two thin sheets of conductive material that are um, uh, separated by some distance and then actually wrapped around each other to, to uh, save space. So, yeah. But you can think of it, and we draw the symbol as being two like plates that are separated. Um, one surface has charge Q and the other negative Q. A capacitor stores energy in an electric field between the surfaces. So if you have charge on one side with one polarity and charge on the other side with the other polarity, um, there's an electric field that uh, is created in between the two plates or between the two surfaces and you have um, energy that's stored. Let a capacitor with voltage V across it and charge Q be characterized by the parameter capacitance C, where the constitutive equation is Q equals C V. We're going to use this term somewhat, constitutive equation. Constitutive means at, that's what constitutes being a capacitor in this case. So it's the equation that says if you have some black box and it behaves like this equation, then it's a capacitor. That's what constitutes a capacitor. Okay, the capacitance, so this parameter that uh, uh, describes the constitutive equation, or, or uh, I guess becomes the linear factor in the constitutive equation, has derived SI unit farad with symbol F, where farad is in, in um, base SI units, it's A, as, uh, amp seconds per volt. A farad is actually quite a lot of capacitance. So you don't see a lot of one farad capacitors out there. Um, very big. Uh, uh, most capacitors have capacitances best represented in microfarads, nanofarads, or picofarads. So those are the more common types or common sizes to see. So you're going to see like a 100 microfarad uh, capacitor in lab, for instance. So that would be a common um, size of the capacitor. The time derivative of the constitutive equation yields the voltage current or VI relationship, what we call the elemental equation for capacitors, which is, I think it's going a little bit, yeah, I'm going to zoom in, nice, uh, dV dt, so we rearranged a little bit here, so now the V, the time derivative of V, we moved it to the left hand side and we are uh, going to move, uh, well, we switched which sides, I guess. We didn't move it to the left-hand side. We switched which sides. So v, dv, dt on this side. C is a constant, okay? So we assume uh, for an ideal capacitor that C is constant. So its time derivative is zero, right? And it happens to be a factor with V, so it sticks around as a factor. Uh, if we want to move to the other side of the equation, it's going to be 1 over C, right? Divide both sides by C. And then dQ dt. What is the time derivative of the charge accumulation? What do you guys think? Is it a quantity we know? Current. 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 That's right. So it's just the current. And this is... Uh, we've called it an elemental equation. And 
Elemental equations are the equations that give us VI relationships, the relationship between the voltage and the current for that component. So we've got our elemental equation, and we have a time derivative in it, right? Time derivative of voltage, and that's new. Resistors have only algebraic current voltage relationships. So circuits with only sources and resistors can be described by algebraic relationships, okay? So before this, we've been able to get away with just algebraic equations describing these circuits. The dynamics of circuits with capacitors, however, are described with differential equations. So now we've got this time derivative, now we've got differential equations. I knew you guys were just dying to get there, and now we're there. We've got our differential equations, and all of that preparation you did beforehand, your review of differential equations and how to solve them, uh, is, is going to pay off now. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, so exciting. It's getting more interesting now. Okay, Not just simple algebra, now we can do some differential equation solutions. And, and when you start solving differential equations, you know you're starting to do dynamics, okay? Dynamic systems are always described by differential equations, okay? So, here we are. Um, so, what are cap capacitors used for? So, capacitors allow us to build many new types of circuits, okay? So, before we had them, we could build resistor circuits and like not that much we can do with resistor circuits alone. Um, but now that we've got capacitors, we can do filtering, um, which is uh, when you've got, for instance, a measurement signal. So say you're in the measurements class, uh, instrumentation class, 315, and you measure a signal and it's noisy. It's got a lot of noise in it. It's typically high frequency noise. So you could filter that out um, with uh, 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 an RC circuit, for instance, a, a, a resistor capacitor circuit. So there, are, and there are more complicated uh, filters as well. Uh, but now that we've got capacitors, we can start doing filtering. Um, energy storage. So we said that capacitors store energy in electric fields, and now we can do that. Resistors don't store any energy; they just turn it into heat, right? So there's that. Um, we can get resonant circuits, so when uh, we talk about the natural frequency and the damping ratio, um, which is something that you guys probably seen a little bit, maybe, um, and you guys did differential equations, we might have talked about that for second order systems, uh, we'll be talking about that a lot more over the next uh, couple years of your time here, so yeah. Uh, and then blocking, so you could like block the DC component of a signal. Um, bypassing, which is, draws the AC component to ground. So these are different things you can do with capacitors. This is why they're so useful. They're, they do lots of different things for us. Capacitors come in a number of varieties, with those with the largest capacity and least expensive being electrolytic capacitors, and the most common being ceramic capacitors. So I need to put some photos in here probably, but the, the uh, electrolytic capacitors tend to look like barrels. They don't all look like barrels, but a lot of them do. Um, so they look like barrels. And uh, a ceramic capacitor is, looks more like um, So a ceramic capacitor is, uh, they're usually like um, an orangey beige color. <laughs> um, you guys have probably seen ceramic capacitors on um, like remote controls that you've pulled apart and seen the insides of the little, the little printed circuit board, the, the green circuit boards in there. A lot of them have got, especially the, the uh, uh, ceramic capacitors. So, there are two functional varieties of capacitors, bipolar and polarized, okay? With circuit diagram symbols shown in figure 1-4. Uh, so, bipolar 
are uh, the A ones, the ones that have the just two parallel lines describing them, and polarized uh, has one line being curved, okay? So polarized capacitors can have voltage drop across in only one direction, okay? From anode to cathode. So anode is the plus, cathode is the minus. Um, otherwise, so if you have a voltage drop the other way across it, um, they are damaged or may explode. Um, usually not like too serious, but like you can get a little shrapnel in your eye, so like you gotta be a little careful with capacitors. Uh, they're usually they're more like hiss puff, and then you know you blew it. So <laughs> sometimes it's a little more scary and fun. Um, okay, electrolytic capacitors are polarized, and ceramic capacitors are bipolar. There are other types besides electrolytic and ceramic, but those are those make up the vast majority of capacitors. Uh, so typically the barrel kind are going to be the, the polarized capacitor. And they've, they, um, um, it's clearly marked on them, like this is the minus sign, like this is, you make sure that it drops this way across. Uh, whereas with the ceramic ones, there's no indication because it doesn't matter. They're just bipolar. You can put them in the circuit either way. It doesn't matter which direction you drop voltage across. Does the curve need to be the minus or the uh, So we should have a voltage drop this way, so, so current should flow that way across the capacitor. It's, uh, uh, it means that when you're using when you're using an electrolytic capacitor, when you're using a, a polarized capacitor, you have to be a little bit um, careful, especially if you have a, an AC signal or a time varying signal. Um, if you've got a, a DC signal, that's like always gonna be positive, you just gotta put it in the right direction, right? If you've got a signal that's varying, um, maybe it's positive now and then it's negative later, um, and so that's when you gotta really be careful. You can do, you can put a bias in an AC signal, say it's a sinusoid, um, and if you bias it all positive, you're fine. So you put in a DC offset, you're fine. But um, it's easy to get into trouble when you have an AC signal with a uh, bipolar capacitor. Yes? The positive and negatives are backwards from up there to what we have in the Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, this is the correct one. Thank you for pointing that out. I, uh, I use a package in, this is all done in LaTeX, and there's a package that I use that changed a, like a flag uh, for like switching the voltage direction. So anyways, like I updated the package and then all of my signs got flipped. I didn't notice it in the version you guys got, so sorry about that. It's now correct online, I think, but I know you guys mostly printed them out, so. So good, please, please do fix that in your notes. Your notes have a minus sign here and a plus sign there, um, which is not correct. Exactly the opposite of what you want, so. Great. Uh, so this is like a, a little sidebar trick that I have found useful in the past, so I thought I would let you know on this. Uh, so what if you need a high capacitance bipolar capacitor? Say your um, the, the problem with with those uh, ceramic capacitors is they have low capacitance, right? So, what if you need high capacitance, but you need to be bipolar? You need to be able to do negative voltages and positive voltages. So here's a trick: put identical high capacity polarized capacitors, cathode to cathode, okay? So back to back, and then uh, what results is effectively a bipolar capacitor with capacitance half that of one of the polarized capacitors, okay? So it's like kind of a nice little trick. Uh, it, it especially comes in, I've, I've used that trick a lot when I'm doing filtering, okay? So if you want to filter things, a lot of times you want a nice big capacitor, especially if you want to get a nice, um, nice filtering with a small, or with just a capacitor without having to do a complicated filter. Uh, that capacitor, um, the, the capacitance of that capacitor 
being large is going to help you out a lot. So sometimes you can use that as a little trick to make a bigger one out of, out of uh, polarized capacitors. OK. That's, uh, that's all for capacitors. Do you guys have any questions on capacitors? OK. Hearing none.